I say to this great convention tonight and to this great nation of ours, I am ready to lead our country. Majority Leader of the Senate, 1961, Vice President, 1965, now nominated by the Democratic Party as its presidential nominee in 1968. Here's Al Wasser. Hubert Humphrey and Muriel Humphrey standing on the podium acknowledging the cheers of this crowd. Cheers which interrupted his speech numerous times. A number of standing ovations. Hubert Humphrey, who used as the theme of his speech the end of an era and the beginning of a new day, seeming to indicate a break of some dimension with Lyndon Johnson. Let's go down to the convention floor now to find out what's happening down there in that sea of happiness, almost an entire sea of happiness. Here is Walter Rogers. Standing down here in the middle of this uh, celebration, the applause for Vice President Humphrey is overpowering. I'm standing here with a man whose very political future actually rides on this next election, Senator Joseph Clark. Senator Clark, has the Vice President offered the Americans a choice? Yes, I thought it was a great speech. Do you think that his remarks on Vietnam will serve to unify, unify the divisions in the Democratic Party? Yes, I do. Do you think that his uh, position as stated tonight will help you get reelected? I would hope that it would. We have a rough, hard battle ahead in Pennsylvania. If the president and his splendid partner, Ed Muskie, keep on this tack for the rest of the election, rest the ball, there's no question about the fact it will help me. Thank you very much, Senator Clark. Paul Rogers in the, on the convention floor amidst the deafening roar. Now back to you, Ed, in the booth. All right, and we'll pass the ball to Al Wasser in the gallery. A very long cheer has just gone up as George McGovern, one of the men who fought Hubert Humphrey for the nomination, has joined him on the podium. They're both raising their arms. The one missing link here, of course, is Eugene McCarthy, who did not come to this final session of the convention. Let's move across the convention hall now to California, where Al Wyman is waiting. We're speaking with uh, Assembly Speaker Josh Unruh. I think that it is uh, indeed uh, indicates that he can break the bonds of the past administration, that he has a very good chance of carrying California. Did you read into the speech, uh, Speaker Unruh, the fact that the Vice President plans to try to break some of the ties with the Johnson administration? Well, I think uh, I think he was trying to say that. At least I hope he was. He, what did you think about what he said concerning Vietnam, sir? Well, I'm not too satisfied with it, but uh, that may clear up. Carmen Warshaw, California's Democratic Committee woman. Mrs. Warshaw, what did you think of Vice President Humphrey's speech? It was a very fine speech. I'm going to wait and see what the action is. That's the story in the California delegation. Al Wyman on the convention floor, back to Ed Brown in the booth. We've had a, uh, a parade now of those standards, the red, white, and blue standards of each of the states, most of them from one end of the hall. Uh, those delegates holding them began moving it, moved around the back of the hall, came down the aisle, and now a good many of them are, are very close to the rostrum. Let's return to the convention floor now. Here's Walter Rogers. I'm standing here in the middle of this uh, celebration, this time with Oregon Senator Wayne Morse. Another man whose political future, ri future rides heavily on the crest of the Humphrey Tide. Senator Morse, do you think the vice president in any way left himself latitude to maneuver out of the Johnson administration harness on Vietnam? Well, I think his whole speech was a speech wide open for maneuvering. He made his pledge to do what was necessary for us to have a new day, carrying out the pledges that he made in that great exception speech. I was very proud of it. I could do whatever I can to help him implement it. Well, I'm satisfied that he does not mean it to be just words. You think then that the Democrats will offer the American people a choice on Vietnam now? I think they must do so. Thank you very much, Senator Morse. Well, Rogers on the convention floor. Now back to you, Ed, where I hope it's a little quieter. 
it isn't much quieter. Al Wasser down in the gallery. This uh, audience still exploding. That last huge roar that went up was for the appearance on the podium of Richard Daly, mayor of Chicago. They are turning in this into a night of cheers for him. Hubert Humphrey still standing there. Now he's turned away from the podium itself, still in the rostrum, surrounded by all the officials of this party and of this convention. And the cheers go on. Those dancing state standards bouncing around the floor, most of them near the rostrum. Incidentally, uh, the, the parade of those standards was led by California. It was the first one that started to move. And we might note that most of the California and New York delegates, those two uh, disruptive delegations at times during this convention, most of the delegates there were standing and applauding at the end of their speech. We pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is Metro Media Radio News, Chicago. Now the strains of Chicago fills this convention hall as well as the near unanimous excitement of this convention crowd that Hubert Humphrey, the man that they've come here to nominate, stands before them now as the standard bearer of the party. And the vice president's speech uh, certainly had a little bit of something for everybody. He quoted Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson, even the Constitution, St. Francis of Assisi. He tried uh, in every way possible to embrace the many warring factions of this party. And he's got about 60 days to see whether he can join together not only the warring factions of this party, but also the dissident factions of this nation. Our coverage of the Democratic Convention will continue in one minute. This is Metro Media Radio News, Chicago. Here at the International Amphitheater in Chicago, Hubert Humphrey standing on the rostrum and waving to this crowd is soaking up, is soaking up every ounce of something that he has been uh, looking forward to for eight years. It's been a long time. And as one of his closest aides said uh, a day or so ago, Hubert Humphrey is a man for whom his time has finally come. And as this excitement and this Note of promise the Democrats hopefully will take with them when they leave the convention hall tonight. There will, of course, remain the great difficulties which surrounded this convention in the city of Chicago all through the week. Difficulties which have not ended yet. Here is Jeff Kamen. Civil rights leader Dick Gregory and 25 delegates to the Democratic National Convention led more than 3,000 young demonstrators from Grant Park across the street from the Hilton Hotel south until they ran into a military blockade. Gregory and the delegates were arrested. Soon, the demonstrators, left without leaders, began shoving the National Guardsmen. This is the way it went. Some people getting pushed real hard with those rifles, but they pushed in first. Have managed to get up through get the up. I'm moving. Moving. I'm moving, officer. I'm moving. Tear gas apparently is in trouble. More tear gas is going. The tear gas sent the demonstrators fleeing and wound up floating into the ghetto community that adjoins the area in which the demonstrators confronted the law. The protest marchers returned to the park across the street from the Hilton Hotel. Most were soon dispersed. Jeff Kamen, Metro Media News, Chicago. This is Dan Blackburn, Metro Media News, back to Conrad Hilton. Thousands of demonstrators are sitting in Grant Park across from the Hilton, singing Blowing in the Wind. Earlier, there were episodes of some tear gas and what looked like smoke bombs fired into the crowd to disperse it. A couple of times, police entered the crowd to bring someone out. Right now, as far south as the eye can see, there are troops. There are heavy lines of troops separating the demonstrators from the hotel, stretch down Michigan Avenue across Balboa and up to the intersection where the Sheraton Blackstone and the Conrad Hilton are located jointly. Then the demonstrators stretch down Balboa away 
and all at the moment is quiet. It hasn't been that way all this evening, but it is quiet at the moment. Earlier, there was a flurry of violence, and Metro Media's Mike Eisgrau was on the scene and has this report. Violence and the booze of the crowd that you can hear are all around us. Sorry, I couldn't talk. A tear gas bomb just dropped about two feet from me and uh, may have burned my leg. I don't know. All I know is it was a, the leg doesn't feel that good. But the crowd is back now, even though they've been shooting these tear gas bombs into us. The crowd scattered, and my tape recorder was ripped from me as the crowd started running for cover. But it doesn't matter. They stand here, and once the tear gas is gone, or whatever it is, they come back and they start singing to the troops. The troops standing here with their rifles at the ready and their gas masks on. My guys growl Metro Media News in the midst of the crowd outside the Hilton Hotel. At one point this evening, the young demonstrators stood and sang two songs. One was America the Beautiful, the other was the Star Spangled Banner. And there is something that one cannot help but feel as you look at these young demonstrators facing row upon row of soldiers, and the demonstrators are singing the Star Spangled Banner. It matters not who sings that song. It still stirs a certain feeling in a watcher or a listener. And when you hear it coming from the young throats sung by the young voices as they face a row of troops here in Chicago, in the heart of America, you wonder a little about the entire system and those on both sides of it. This is Dan Blackburn, Metro Media News at the Conrad Hilton. Now back to Ed Brown in the booth. The Democrats at this convention in 1968 have spent so much time fighting that they are very reluctant to give up this moment of pure haphazard enjoyment. The reception and the overwhelming endorsement of Hubert Humphrey by the majority of these delegates continues in this convention hall, the amphitheater in Chicago. Throughout this night, we've been hearing from Metro Media correspondents in Baltimore, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, Washington, San Francisco, Detroit, and other places on how the nation is reacting to the events this week in Chicago in and outside the convention hall. Here is Jay Richards, our Metro Media affiliate WING in Dayton. Dayton is not an especially politically minded city, but citizens are interested. They listen to, watch, and read campaign coverage, and some, mostly George Wallace supporters, write letters to the editor. They expected Richard Nixon to win in Miami, and they certainly weren't surprised to see Vice President Humphrey win in Chicago. There was disappointment when the Vietnam Peace Plank was defeated. A group of young people held a prayer meeting last night at the courthouse to mourn what they called the death of democracy. But the biggest reaction has been to the way the convention was handled. People said they couldn't believe the fights they saw on the convention floor, the strong-arm tactics of security officers in the amphitheater, and the perhaps boss tweed tactics of Chicago Mayor Daley. There was disgust at the fighting in the streets. Most felt the young protesters had little business in Chicago at all, but they felt the stormtrooper viciousness shown by some Chicago police officers was much more out of order. There has not been, however, a turn against the Democratic Party as a whole because people feel, among all the yelling, fighting, tear gas, and nightsticks, the Democratic Party was the one victimized the most. Jay Richards, Metro Media News, Dayton. Republicans have reacted to Hubert Humphrey and his selection of Senator Edmund Muskie as a running mate today by saying that the Democrats were only offering the voters more of the same. Colorado Governor John Love, who's head of the GOP listening post here in Chicago, said uh, the main senator, for example, is a Johnson-Humphrey administration stalwart. And it emphasizes the choice uh, represented to the American voter, he said, four more years of the same. That uh, reaction, of course, would uh, is expected. Earlier today, another one of those uh, listening Republicans in Chicago, Pat Buchanan, an aide of of the former Vice President Richard Nixon, had this conversation with Mike Eisgrau. Buchanan, uh, the Republican Party has given its uh, overall reaction to this, but you've been with Mr. Nixon for at least three years. Uh, how does Mr. Nixon feel? How has he felt about what has happened here in Chicago? 
Well, I haven't spoken with him in any detail about the events going on here, but I, I think that uh, more important than what happened outside this hotel will be what happened at the convention. Uh, the disunion, the rancor, and the bitterness that uh, now permeates the Democratic Party was evident there. You had a, a very divided party, a bitter party, and uh, uh, there's some real question as to whether it could be an effective instrument either to unite the country or to govern it. Is there still a split in the Republican Party despite their protestations of unity? Uh, no, I think I can say uh, uh, not just on a political basis. The Republican Party is more united now than it's been uh, uh, any time, and I can recall it, uh, since certainly since 1960 when Mr. Nixon was a candidate before. The party certainly pulled together from the situation it was in in 1964. This is the moment when on that rostrum there's a big crowd behind Vice President Humphrey. These are many of the leading members of the Senate and the House of Representatives. They are men up for election in November. They are party leaders. They are those who help the Vice President's campaign. Now, they are those who step for a moment to the rostrum, stand beside him so the pictures can be taken, and they can all stand for a moment in the reflected glory of the man who has been nominated by the party to run for president. And still, the celebration continues. To the convention floor now and Walter Rogers. I'm standing here on the convention floor with a delegate from the state of New York, Ted Sorensen, a former advisor to President John Kennedy, an author and an advisor to Robert Kennedy. Mr. Sorensen, do you think Hubert Humphrey is now the man to unify the Democratic Party? He is the only man who is in a position to do so because he is the nominee of our party. I think he has a tough job on his hands, very frankly. What are the obstacles confronting him? I think the party has been very badly uh, damaged and divided by the convention, the bitterness of the disputes and the disorders which took place inside and outside the convention hall. Mr. Sorensen, as close as you were to the Kennedy brothers, can you tell me if you heard anything in, Sen in Vice President Humphrey's speech this evening to which, to which they would associate themselves with? Well, I thought the speech was a generally appropriate Democratic Party speech to which most Democrats could take no exception. Are you saying it had no substance? No, I thought it was not a speech of, that contained any specific solution. Do you think it offers alternatives on Vietnam? I didn't hear any, but perhaps upon uh, a closer reading it does. The Vice President certainly said he wanted peace in Vietnam, and I endorse that. One last question, Mr. Sorensen. What are your plans now? Will you campaign for the vice president? Oh, yes. I'm a Democrat, and I have always intended to support the nominee of the party, and I will do so. Is victory within your grasp? Now, very frankly, I think it's going to be tough. If the election were held tomorrow, Dick Nixon would probably be elected president. I think we have to prevent that for the good of the country which is a lot more important. ...close to the Kennedy family and certainly a member of the Kennedy McGovern camp. Walter Rogers on the convention floor. Now back to you, Ed, in the booth. Well, the Democrats have uh, calmed down now, and it will only be a few minutes before it will all be gabbled to a conclusion. Your, our coverage of the Democratic convention will continue in one minute. This is Metro Media Radio News, Chicago. At the International Amphitheater in Chicago, the Democratic National Convention uh, has one more item on the agenda before they can finally uh, close it all out tonight. At this moment on the two screens, which are suspended from the ceilings diagonally across this convention hall, there is now being shown a, a film of the vice president. This had been scheduled for earlier in the evening and it runs about 27 minutes, and they felt that it was much more important to get the vice president here live and get on to the film later, although uh, some of the delegates are beginning to file out. The, the galleries are now uh, almost empty on one side of the convention hall, and most of the seats directly opposite our broadcasting booth are also uh, emptying rather quickly as well. George McGovern uh, was here tonight and sat in one of the, the VIP boxes to the left of the rostrum, and. He took his bow and appeared on the rostrum with Vice President Humphrey. Eugene McCarthy uh, was not here. He had told his uh, followers earlier today that he'll still be around. 
told them not to despair of the American political system, at least as he saw it should work, and he has not yet endorsed the vice president. My position, he said, is that I don't endorse anybody at this particular moment. Here is Al Wasser in the gallery of this convention hall. And uh, so ends a rather unusual convention, one which featured quite a bit of division within the Democratic Party, and uh, one which Hubert Humphrey hopes now will unite behind him. Perhaps, <coughs> as Ted Sorensen said a few moments ago, uh, they will regard the fear of Richard Nixon as president as greater than the fact that they have lost their bid for the nomination, the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, it remains to be seen, however, there is a very large question now. What happens to the followers of Eugene McCarthy? Senator McCarthy today said he would endorse no one, and he did not attend this final session of the convention, as did George McGovern. And where do the McCarthy followers go? They started out last fall without any hope whatsoever. Their hopes were built up in New Hampshire, and they thought they might actually win. They didn't. Many of them are talking about forming a fourth party, and there is a great fear that they will drop out of the political scene altogether and take their protest back into the streets. That probably would be a bit sad for these people, young and old alike, the new politicians, those of the new politics, those who have not been actively engaged in politics, have accomplished quite a bit of what they set out to accomplish this year. They demonstrated that uh, it was possible to fight City Hall, or even the White House. And they proved that while they might not be able to determine the exact course of American politics, they can change that course. They did it in New Hampshire when the impossible dream of challenging an incumbent president in, in his own party's primary proved to be not so impossible. They did it when that demonstration of the possible brought Robert Kennedy into the race. Kennedy's death disheartened them, but except won their battle to reform the Democratic Party system for choosing presidential nominees in the future. By eliminating the unit rule and opening the party at all levels to minority say and influence. It would be tragic if they don't use that opening to make that influence felt in the future. And the man who may have the most to do with it, whether they do use that opening yet, is the man who first led them to it, Eugene McCarthy, the man who was not here tonight. If he just goes fishing now, as he says he will, the young people he's brought into the political process may do the same. Or they may take their ideas back into the streets. And in the streets, their heads could serve as targets for police clubs instead of for the production of the new and better America they want. It remains to be seen what happens to these people who lost the nomination at this convention, but who did win quite a bit in the last nine months. This uh, convention ends, as you point out, Al, with a great many question marks, but I think the Democrats do have uh, some pluses to show for their work here. After all, the evidence of discrimination in the political activities of the uh, parties in Mississippi and Georgia led to significant changes in those delegations are seated here. The symbolic but yet very significant nomination of two black men for president and vice president, and even the difficulties in Chicago on the streets of the city showed the need to respond to those political views which uh, have until now been operating outside the confines of district clubhouses. And if not, it will obviously mean that these uh, views will remain in dissent and in the streets. And prove really that the only way to have justice, law, and order is both parties want is to give everybody a, a piece of the action. And for most Americans who view these conventions, uh, some with a good deal of cynicism, others with a good deal of help and hope because uh, these periodic changes in government, whether it's an actual change of party or simply the movement from one administration to another by uh, the same president, it gives a good many people the feeling that uh, the problems which seem so unsolvable on the last day in office of the old president 
suddenly become very solvable on the first day of the new one. And it is this uh, kind of hope which uh, emerges in the nation every four years. And it's the kind of hope which both these parties uh, will now be bringing with them in the campaign through November. For all of our Metro Media stations coast to coast, for the team of Metro Media correspondents who have operated here in the convention hall, in this broadcasting booth, down on the floor, in the caucus rooms, in the studio complexes, elsewhere in this vast complex of buildings of the stockyards in Chicago, for the correspondents who have been following the candidates all through the campaign, remain with them for every single minute of every day here in Chicago, for all of the people who have uh, helped to put together one of the most monumental political years, and it's still not over yet, still a good deal for all of them to do. So for all of them, for all of our stations coast to coast, this is Edward Brown, Metro Media Radio News, at the Democratic National Convention, the International Amphitheater in Chicago.